Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we were just standing backstage collectively thinking about the moments of existential angst in all of our careers. I can only go back 35 years, 1994, the Asian debt crisis of 1998, the dot-com bust, Lehman, COVID, and more recently to be live in Zurich for the moment that Credit Suisse became UBS. And the proposition is that, you know, we're seeing the West drift to a form of state capitalism that we often, asso often associate with perhaps the emerging markets. So, Elham, let's start the conversation there, because in my lifetime, central banks, regulators, and governments have bailed us out time and time again to save the system, to save society. Right now, do you think this is good capitalism at work or capitalism with folly at play? Okay, let me take the question in a different way. <laughs> if there's a crisis in a country, in the banking sector, banks are going to have a major issue, failures, non-capability to stand up. If the government doesn't step in to support the banking sector, we'll have a big turmoil in the financial sector, in the capital requirements and adequacy of these banks, in the lending, and depositors will run to withdraw their money. So unfortunately, whether we like it or not, the government, in certain occasions, they have to step in, whether by decision-making or by interfering, by injecting capital, or supporting and obliging banks to merge. And that I have seen in my career in the last how many years? I don't want to say them so that you know my age. So you will see how it is critical that the government has to step in. And the example you said about Credit Suisse, if the situation was not quickly managed, there will be more spillovers, more problems. And I think worldwide, after Silicon Valley, First Republic, everybody will be panicking and simple people will just go for the deposits to take it and keep it at home because he doesn't understand what's happening around him. And these are the majority of our people in the world. Michael, to you, you, you stepped into credit, you stepped into <laughs> MasterCard, almost, almost a Freudian slip there, I, you know, at a tough time in COVID. But right. as we start this conversation between, between, the, th between the three of you, um, your first take on, on that moment of existential angst, that week, that period of time, just reflect for a moment to the audience of how you saw the solution and whether it was a good solution and, and what you thought during that period of time. Right, so stepping into this role in uh, uh, February 2020, essentially, when everything just uh, kind of went uh, downhill right into COVID, what a start. Um, <laughs> I think to your point about state capitalism, I think it's fair to say governments around the world did step in and that was good. You know, building on Elham's point, that was needed. Um, helping the public health system and so forth. But it's also true, we would have not gone through this crisis without the private sector. Um, I think we should talk about that side of the coin as well, but the private sector did step in. Just think about one aspect through the lens of a company like MasterCard. You know, we operate the digital economy. The digital economy kept us going while we were all locked in at home. That is resilience. You know, that is an aspect that helped. But I think there are learnings over the last three years on how resilient we need to be for the next unexpected thing that will happen. You know, learnings are for, by sector, by country. Clearly not every country has been hit the same way. So there's an opportunity for international coordination on policy and how different countries deal with these crises. More alignment will be a good thing. On a sectoral basis, I think what is in most economies the backbone of the economy, it's small business. Medium-sized and small businesses, they have been hit the hardest yes. by this crisis. And we just have to do a better job for small business going forward because the unexpected next thing will happen for sure. I think there's another aspect on resilience around all of this is, and that is all the people that have turned on a dime and reacted to COVID, to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, to you know, stresses on the banking system and so forth. There's a leadership and a cultural element in most private sector companies as well as in the government. How are you agile enough? In all of that, there's the common thread of mental well-being. People worry through these times. So if you want people to be agile, you've got to give, create an environment of, you know, physical and mental safety and focusing on well-being. That's something that I think we have overlooked. If we get that right, we fix a few of the sectors, we drive 
international coordination in a better way. I think when the next thing happens, hopefully it's not too soon, we should be in a better place. But there were great stories of resilience over the last three years, for sure. I mean, what, what we've seen here is government regulators and central banks all at play in different moments, by the way, not just through Credit Suisse, but I think in COVID, it was even, even more apparent in terms of governments and, and global response. Yahya, uh, you came up with a wonderful phrase. There was, there was government money, God's money, and then there's you know, gold and silver. But you know, we're, we're trying to understand moments of existential angst and, and whether governments are doing the right thing with central banks and, 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 and saving institutions. What's your first take on what we've seen recently? Yes, thank you. If you look on the global capitalization, the main topics, you are thinking it's good or not, right? It's like a knife with two edges. Right? The one who affected yeah, we can name it like J.P. Morgan. They took over Mutual, uh, Washington yep. Mutual, right? and uh, Bertrand, and then UBS have taken over uh, Credit Suisse. Seems it's not fair for that institution, especially like J.P. Morgan. After they took over, and then some penalties on X companies they took over, they got the penalty. They have to bear the risk. But on the other side, how many people were saved their fund because that? creation of the central bank. So means that it is a really what we call it government money. Government money, government money uh, I means that the one who have the rule and control on the currencies and all the monetary policies. Because in the world you have three types of money, right? One is the basic one, is gold, silver, that call God's money. Okay. And then the second thing is the government money. And third things that started with the cryptos. Crypto actually is the effort of people who think that government is not fair because they can control uh, the trade business by weakening or strengthening the value of their currency. Some government did it. That's why they created cryptocurrency. They say this is a people money. Nobody will control this unless on their blockchains environment, right? But it's proven that in the beginning, like Bitcoin, it's go up very fast, but suddenly it's drop up again and drop. So means that even they call people's money, they even cannot control. And the impact can be damaging peoples also who believe on their stories. That is my thinking about this. But you not but, but you live in Asia, you grew up there, your career yeah. is there. So you've seen uh, a very different form of free market development. Um, so do you agree or disagree that the West is drifting to a form of state capitalism? Or do you think that's a folly? Uh, I think for the better shape for a lot of people, I think they have to do that kind of things as far as that are controllable and really for the sake of uh, helping a lot of uh, people because you have uh, two uh, steps of what they call it a policy, right? Whether you want to do strict, as Elam uh, mentioned before, you have to do in one or two days, make the decision. You don't have time if you really let the market uh, back to normal. So. Let's just then extrapolate forward because we're, we're on this panel to talk about the state of capitalism and where we are, which is actually when I read the title, I thought this is very existential for me to deal with. I deal with markets on a daily basis. You know, how, how do I approach this? And I thought about it through the remuneration lens. Banks have been taken over. JP Morgan has uh, taken out uh, SVB. You have Noel Quinn bought, bought the SVB assets in the United Kingdom, which takes us back then to what drives deals, what drives banks, what drives uh, the motivation here, and ultimately it is about remuneration and bonuses. Now, if the government or the central bank backstops, as they have done, the FDIC is insuring deposits and there's been <coughs> deals done to help with bad losses, etc. What does that mean for bonus and remuneration culture, which is in a free market, but it's a, a bank which is backstopped by the state? What do you think that means for bonus and culture, Elham? Um, we always say it's good that you have a short memory, 
especially when we lose people very close to us, and we can survive. But when I look at history, and I saw 2009, and before that we lived the Far East, a little bit of Latin America, and regional issues. Uh, bankers over the time, probably they retire, others come, new generation, new thinking. They didn't live these kind of situations. But they tend to forget from the old history and the lessons. And what happens when you read, you know, in the newspapers or the social media, everybody is just, you know, looking at, it has to be a big package, it has to be the bonus, it has to be how multiples of his salary, how much he can guarantee when he's retiring. It mostly, it doesn't, it's not publicly said as such, but between the lines you see it. And then at the end of the day, those people who are responsible in many occasions for certain decisions on the top level, whether they are partially shareholders or board of directors or the CEO or the top executives, most of them, they will leave five years after that or four years because of their decisions, things change. I agree there will be change in the fundamentals of the economic situation. Mm -hmm. And the world is moving and it's dynamic. But still, the strict regulations to penalize people on the top level is not there. They say the person retired, we ask them to leave. That's not enough. Okay, in the GCC, we don't have taxes as such. But when you look at countries in the US, Canada, Europe, the taxpayers, and we're talking about poverty, reducing the parity among people, these are the ones who are paying the real price, the middle class, whom we are trying to support when we come and sit on the bench and we say, SME, please give them a chance. Those are the people who pay from their own difficult time and difficult money to get things to go ahead. I think rules and regulations should be stricter, especially when it comes to CEOs like myself and people on the top level who make the decision making. Then people will wake up a little bit. It's not the matter of growing your balance sheet or growing in terms of banking I'm talking, which is mm -hmm. the industry I know well in a way. Um, just growing the books doesn't make you a good bank. We have learned that and we saw the lessons. The non-performing loans, the quality of your portfolio, on what basis you approve these loans, the basics of credit. Sometimes we tend to forget it. And then we say the risk people are a problem. The risk people are not a problem. They are the ones trying to tell me like your mother and father. Be careful, but we hate them. Well, the risk people were supposed to be in charge in certain institutions uh, to save us. Michael, you, you're nodding there with uh, Elham in, in terms of remuneration and the bonus culture. But this is about, this is what capitalism, I mean, I grew up in banking. I grew up as a banker, a broker, uh, and a terrible commodity trader, I have got to add. Um, <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> but money motivated me. Okay. I, that's maybe a shameful thing. I don't no, know. Maybe okay. that's not a shameful thing to say. I was motivated by money. I was motivated by bonus. And I was motivated by a world in which you were driven to deliver more. Does the culture need to change? I don't think the world has changed that much since uh -oh. I was any of those things. No. Right. So I, I think this idea of paying for performance, that's essentially what you experienced yes. at the time. And that holds true. It, it holds true today. I think one just needs to be a little more nuanced around what performance means. It's not tom uh, performance for tomorrow. It's performance over the long run. It's commercial sustainability. And it's alignment with shareholder interests. Now, from a public policy, uh, public uh, company perspective, um, for a US listed public company, very clearly the say on pay has you know, really moved into focus. There's scrutiny on these kind of alignments. Uh, Every year in proxy season, this is analyzed left, right, and center, and I think the cultures are going in the right direction to see, is there true long-term alignment uh, of the payouts, and not just what is allocated, but the payouts with what the shareholders are receiving and how is this generally um, you know, driving value for the company beyond its own business, the focus on how are you accounting for ESG goals and various other things are coming together, I think, to an evolved version of what you have lived in and what I have, I have lived in when I started. I shouldn't have admitted it, rules. should I? I really shouldn't have admitted it on stage. But I think we've come a long way. But is there always more to do? Absolutely. I mean, in MasterCard, what we're trying to do is it's not just the compensation. It mm -hmm. goes a bit further. Remuneration as a philosophy, uh, philosophy its benefits is, you know, aspects of balancing it over time. It is your pension plan, it's various other things. In the end, we have to be competitive from a talent perspective. We want to have the best people. 
Our and compensation policy, remuneration policy is geared to the best people want to be at MasterCard. So all of those elements, and I think the learnings that we've had over the year, most recently clawback policies came uh -huh. into focus of the SEC and so forth. It continues to evolve, and I think in the right direction. Maybe that, 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 that evolves into a better form of capitalism, and that's what I want to benchmark. But hold that thought, because I want to bring Yahya into it. When we were on the phone, Yahya said, Manis, you know, banks just need to be not too greedy. But tell me this and tell the audience. I mean, mot motivating your staff at how many current accounts did you say to me you had? 335? 35 million. Sorry, I, I was going for thousands. 335 million <laughs> bank accounts. How do you motivate? I mean, money must be an incredibly important part, you know, base and bonus to motivate people to activate those accounts. How do you manage that in, in, in today's market, in today's world? Yeah, for sure that bonus uh, is very important, but we do have like clawback that if things happen, it's able to get back the money that they receive. Right? That's one thing. Second thing is that we give shares to staff and employees, includes a board of directors, mm -hmm. and then they should lock up for certain periods. In our bank, we clock, uh, lock up for three years. And once the board of directors selling the shares, they should announce to the public, right? That is some restriction for the bonus. But in, internally, we try to create it a teamwork, right? It seems a little bit different because I believe many banks believe on KPI and KPI related to direct bonus to this division or the brand or this uh, region. In my bank, we try to manage it to cooperation and teamwork from the business unit and the supporting units. Because in my experience, without supporting units, supporting the business unit, you cannot do anything. That's why. We really try to make a strong teamwork by having okay. related a uh, fair uh, distribution on the bonuses, not uh, too wide, uh, low and high. But Michael, this has been in part and, and part of your, your, your raison d'etre. There's been a big overhaul of remuneration within MasterCard. How much of that is your vision? and how much of it perhaps is carried forward from, from your predecessor. What is your vision for remuneration? Do you believe in a fair, more equitable process of remuneration? What, what is the overhaul that you've done, and what would you say the outcome has been? Yeah, um, so continuous journey. Um, no revolution on compensation. Because the company always had to operate uh, as a first-class company when it comes to um, compensation. We always competed for the best people. But I tell you one, one reason thing that we have very specifically decided to do is on our ESG commitments as a company, um, which are very specific, we say we're going to drive a billion people into the financial system through financial inclusion. We're going to be uh, carbon neutral and net zero by 2040 and so forth. Mm -hmm. We have said, okay, we need to make sure that everybody who works in MasterCard feels connected to these commitments and sees the expectation that they make a difference on that. So what we have done is we've taken the goals, numeric goals, and we hard-coded them into our compensation. As a payment technology company, we're the first ones to do that. So basically, as your bonus is calculated, has, have we made progress vis-a-vis -vis those goals? Mm -hmm. And it will automatically look good for you or less good. So that is a real step forward where I think you can take very specific aspects of what you're trying to do as a company and accentuate them in compensation. That is a step forward that we haven't done in the past. And it's been you know, discussed in the broader discourse. Is that a good thing to do? We believe it is. And I think others will come on board. Leaders lead from the top in terms of remuneration, Alham. So what's your message, short and brief? Because I want to move on to the macro conversation in just a moment about remuneration within your organization. KPIs are a main indicator, as Yahya just mentioned, because it makes you able to judge how was the performance of every staff, whether on the business area or the support area, and that's okay. But my message was on the top, top level, when I see it in mm -hmm. the banking industry in general, there must be other ways that we look at those levels, because they are really responsible for many of the crises that happens, and then they are not blamed at all. So it would be remiss if I have 
the Asian economy, the GCC economy, and the man whose cards you all use electronically uh, and, and physically, not to get a benchmark for the global economy. Michael, to you first of all, uh, lots of people are debating. I've, I've just had a conversation with Sebastian Bezan. He can't charge enough to get us into luxury hotels. Is there any cracks in the spending patterns? Are you seeing any slowdown in any of your markets, or are you just on fire and having a cracking year? Right. Um, the consumer has been remarkably resilient. So we just talked through the last three years and everything that hit us. Um, the consumer has made ends meet, and that plays out relatively similarly across each of the regions. So if we do a quick around, walk around the world, starting in the United States, solid performance throughout the last uh, couple of years. More recently, some moderation, but still the consumer has remained resilient. You look into Europe, Europe, we were all very worried about Europe looking at the winter. The mild winter came about and con uh, Europe continued to surprise. Quarter by quarter, the European consumer continues to spend. You come to the Middle East here, I mean, just walk outside. Walk through Doha and the question is answered. Uh, so that is looking pretty positive. So across the board, that is good. If you zoom out and say where there's still potential for even more post-pandemic recovery momentum, you see it in Asia, um, because clearly, yeah, the borders open later than in the rest of the world. Travel has kicked in later, but now you start to show up in the airport, you start to see a lot of people from Asia now traveling and venturing out, so that is looking good. Is it outward transactions from Asia? How is China? Because I think everybody's fascinated to know this uneven, unequal recovery. Would you agree unequal, uneven recovery? How would you describe China? So China um, is on a recovery path. Uneven versus what? I'm not sure what you mean with that, but what I can tell you is, you know, if, if you just look at our numbers, which are a pretty good indicator of what's going on in terms of travel, for example, we are on the outbound side where Chinese are traveling the world. Um, you're at 65% pre-crisis. So that leaves a lot of potential upwards, but it's probably a bigger number than we would have expected. Inbound the other way, China has only recently changed its COVID rules and so forth. We had 45%. So that looks very different than most other countries where the numbers on cross-border travel are largely around pre-crisis levels already. Yeah, yeah, great deal of stimulus still in the system. Some would say uh, savings are high from the Asia perspective from the 335 billion accounts that you have. A, a snapshot for, for the room, uh, 35,000 foot view. Uh, in, in terms of the economy, momentum, pre-COVID, where we are now. What's the risk here as we talk about capitalism? What's the risk in your economy? Yeah, I think basically uh, developing countries like Indonesia, we able to manage the growth of economy better than in average of world average, right? The GDP growth, the inflation, we can control very well. We are blessed because Indonesia have the CPO market and then also we have the mining like nickel and other things, right? So, uh, so far we haven't seen any risk of the what's so-called the global capitalization because the central bank and the banking supervisory uh, body in Indonesia work together with the banking community. They try to keep on flushing the money. They are not tightening the money. They tried to increase interest rate only 225 basis point, despite in US it's been 500 basis Is that full marks then for Perry Wajojo? <laughs> would you give him, what would you give him a rating as, as the central banker on the system? Uh, sorry, sorry. How, how would you rate your central bank's performance in this, in this current? I think it's very great because they control mon monetary, the exchange rate, they can control uh, strengthening a rupiah against dollar, and inflation under control. So I think uh, eight, Points, I think. Eight out of ten. And we were in the green room and Elham said, you know, man, it's reflected back on a number of crises. And when women are in control, it is a different set of outcomes. So we leave the final word on this panel, to the lady on the panel, in terms of her <laughs> view. The GCC, it's lit up at home in the UAE, here in Qatar. I was here for the World Cup. Quick snapshot. How bullish are you? The closing lines to the lady on the panel. Okay. Um, I try to be optimistic. But still, you know, there are things, and I have been seeing on the stage, inflation, Ukraine, the wars, opening up China, <coughs> unemployment, you know, it's everywhere. People graduating, they can't find suitable jobs, um, artificial intelligence, technology. So we have bad news and good news. But when you look at the good news, it's not as much as the bad news. 
But I look at GCC and I look at Kuwait, for example. Yeah. Kuwait have a strong banking sector. So even with the crisis and the problems, because we have a strong also central bank. So they are always on the top of everything. And the GCC central banks, they always are in touch daily, weekly. They check on the things from different types of stuff. So they are, Silicon Valley happens, immediately you receive a call. What's happening with you? Any exposures? Let us know. So we are very much into dialogue. Uh, implementation of IRFS9, they do it to the extreme in addition to what is required. Capital adequacy drops to 16, not, we don't like it. So we have a very strong banking sector. And we're talking about the performance. There is a drop maybe expected for 23 in Kuwait in economy. Still, the first quarter, banks have done very well and it's expected to be done. They are concentrating on the market they know. We have many banks, yes, 10 banks, five Islamic, five conventional, but they are more into the banking sector in Kuwait. A little bit regionally, but it's not except two or three banks. So that's the part which I see very positive. The new generation, many of them are smart. They have the potential, they have the intention, and they would like to grow, but they need the support in coaching, training, taking care of them because they cannot grow by themselves. And you have to tell them from the beginning, clarity. Let them be aware because they are just young. We, we thought or we think they know. <clears throat> so coaching is very, very important. Well, we didn't solve global capitalism on the panel, but we've hopefully given you food for thought and a global snapshot. Alham, Michael, and Yahya, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.